Welcome back, students, to this new lecture on reports in QGIS 3. This is a very powerful new feature, and it's still in active development. I know that there are plans to add quite a bit of functionality to reports in QGIS 3 before the next long-term release. And I'm excited to see what they come up with, but I don't have any inside knowledge, so we're just going to have to wait and see. And for this reason as well, I'm just going to introduce the topic and go over it pretty quickly so that you can get started using it if it looks like something that will be useful to you. But I'm going to wait until QJS 3.2 comes out, and then I'll come back and revisit it and probably add some more details. Our reports cover some of the same basic functionality that was available in QGIS 3 using map atlases, but it greatly expands that functionality. As we saw in the last lecture, map atlases are still available in QGIS 3, so if you're comfortable with those, you don't have to worry, you can still use them. But I suspect that at some point, the new report feature will take over that completely. Although I will admit that it's not fully polished at the present time. The top level object in a report is called the report, and you can include different objects below that nested underneath it. You can include a header and or a footer page. The header gets printed once at the beginning of the report, and the footer gets printed once at the very end of the report. So this may be a title page or acknowledgments or something like that. And each one of these header and footer layouts can also have multiple pages in it as well. You can also add two types of sections to the report. Static pages are just a single layout that you can include that might be an overview map or a legend or something like that. Field groups, on the other hand, are similar to what we think of as map atlases. But like the main report, each field group section can get its own unique header and footer. For the body section, you choose a layer and a field, and each feature in that layer gets a page that is focused on it just like the features in the grid in our map atlas from the last couple lectures. You can have multiple static sections with multiple field group sections in the report, and each section can have subsections nested within it. For instance, if you use a map grid like we did for our map atlas in the last two lectures as a field group section, then each grid sector can also have static sections and field group sections that might have a separate close-up map for each nest within that area. That gets printed after the grid sector overview, and each field group can have headers or footers and a body section as well. So you may be getting the picture that you can quickly get very complicated with these reports and automate the printing of a huge amount of data, and it can be a little confusing. But let's go take a look at a live demo, and hopefully that will make things a little simpler. So I'm going to start in QGIS 3 right here with kind of an overview map showing in my main map canvas. And then I'm going to go to my project menu, and I'll come down here to new report. And I'm going to give it a report title. I'm just going to call it example. And I'm going to expand this so we can have a better look and give myself a little bit more space in here. Anyway, this looks a lot like a map layout, although we don't see the actual page in here quite yet. We have an items panel and our properties panel, etc. But what's new is over here we have a report organizer panel. And so under this top level report, I can include a report header or a report footer. So I'm going to click the include report header box and click edit. And there I see my page layout. And I can add the same map elements over here as we did with the page layout. But this is just going to be the first page. So it's going to be kind of like a cover page. So I'm just going to add some text right in here. And the text is just going to say DJ Basin Environmental Constraints. And I'm just going to center that and increase the text size. You can do that here just by increasing the font size. And I might want to put a picture. Maybe that's a company logo. I'm not going to do a company logo. I'm just going to put a picture in here of my dog just for fun. And then maybe another text label with the name of my company. We'll call it Random Environmental. So it's just a cover page. You can do this however you want. I'm also going to put a footer in here. And just for the sake of keeping things simple, my footer is just going to say End of Report. And that's all I can do at the top level pretty much. But you see down here I have this plus symbol, so I can add another section. And I'm going to add a static layout. And all this is really is just another blank page that I can put 
any kind of element that I have available over here. So I'm going to click Edit, and you'll see we have up here is the body of the section. And here I'm going to just add a new map element. And I'm just going to put a label on here so we know what it is. I'm not going to get too fancy with the formatting for the purposes of this lecture. We've seen previously all the things that we can do. I'll just call this Project Area Overview. We'll change the font size and center it, and just like that. And I'm going to change the scale over here too, just so we can get a little bit better idea of the spatial context. And I'm going to add another static section to the report. So I go up here and click on Report, and hit the plus sign, and Static Layout section again. And I'll hit my Edit button. And this time, I'm going to throw a legend in here. I'm going to turn Auto Update off and remove some of these that we don't really need anymore. The Atlas Grid, I'll move up to the top, and I'll remove the imagery and the OpenStreetMap layer as well. And then I'll make it three columns wide, and change some of these font sizes around a little bit. And I'm not going to get too fancy with this, like I said, just to give you an idea of what's possible. And then under Report again, I'm going to add another section, but this time it's going to be a field group section. And I'm going to choose the Atlas Grid and the View field as my sections. And I could also include a header and a footer around the field group section, but I'm not. I'm just going to include the body. And I will edit that. So the body, I actually want to change what layers are included and how they're symbolized and stuff. So I'm going to go back to this first section and edit it. And in this map, I'm going to lock the layers here so they don't get changed. And then I'll go back to my grid view group and edit the body. And in here, I'm going to say that the extent is controlled by the report. And it's going to be a fixed scale. And that scale will be 1 to 24,000. Make this whole thing a little bit bigger, I think. And change that back to 1 to 24,000. So that I can see that the map view covers an entire grid sector at this scale. And I'm going to turn on linear projects, burrowing owl habitat, bald eagle nests, raptor nests, and heron rookeries. And then I go back to my report section and refresh the view. And there we see I have one section, along with the environmental constraint data that's included in that section. Now we'll notice that we have the field set to view. And if I go back to QGIS, I've taken the liberty of creating an eagle buffers layer. And that eagle buffer, if I open the attribute table, has a nest in the status. But what I really wanted to have is a field called view. And it has to be named view. It has to be named the same as what we had our field group in the report as. And that column will hold the view that this nest is associated with. And how do I get that? Well, I happen to have a processing tool in my toolbox. And I'm just going to search for it. It's called, I think, Join by Location. Join Attributes by Location. And I'm going to use this Eagle Buffers as my input layer. And the Join layer will be the Atlas Grid. The predicate will be Intersects. And what I want is the value of the View field. And I'll run that. And so now I have this join layer. And if I look at the properties for it, I see I have a view column. And in that, it tells me which viewport this nest is located in. So we have two that are in A3, one that's in A4, one in A5, etc. So I'm actually going to turn this joined layer off. So it's not visible, but we're still going to use it in our report. So if I go back to my report screen, I can add another field group section, but this time I'm going to add it as a subsection to the Atlas Grid viewport. And the layer is going to be this joined layer. The field is also going to be view, because the field here has to match the field here. That's what connects these two together. So in my join layer now, I'm going to click Include Body and click Edit. And then I'm also going to add a map frame. This map frame is also going to be controlled by the report. 
It's also going to have a fixed scale, but this time the scale is going to be 1 to 12,000. And what I want to show actually is not this OpenStreetMaps layer, but the Esri imagery layer. So I'm going to turn the Esri imagery layer on, go back, click refresh, and I'm going to lock my layers and the style. And now I think we're done. I'm going to create a PDF of this report. And I think what it's going to do is we'll get a map for each one of those grid sections with the open street map in the background that shows a whole section at once. And then for each eagle's nest, it's going to have a close-up with the aerial photography in the background. So I'll come to report. I'll click export report as a PDF. I'm just going to call it example PDF and hit save. It's going to chug away for a while. See, so it's exporting section 2, section 3, section 4, etc. And so I'm going to pause this recording and come back when it's done and we'll take a look. Okay, I'm back. It's finished. I'm looking at the example PDF in the Adobe Reader program. And so this is the first page. This was the header for our report, just like we created it. The next page is a section layout, and it's just this project area overview map that we created. The next page was a legend. Not a very pretty looking legend. We could do a lot better, but like I said, this was just to demonstrate. Didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on all the details. And then we start with our field group layer. So the first field group was this sector A1. There's not a whole lot in there. The next one is A10. It's just because it's sorting this as text because it starts with A, so A10 comes before A2. It probably would have been better off if we named this A09 and then it would have sorted in numerical order as well. But the next one again is A11, and then we have A2, A3, but then notice that A3 has two eagles nests in it. So instead of going straight to A4, now we're going down to this next level and we're going to look at a close up of the eagles nests that are in A3. So the first one's number 51. See eagles nest number 51 here? That's a very close up. It doesn't actually look like a place where there would be an eagles nest. And that's because this data was randomly generated. There's not actually an eagles nest there, so don't go there and try and find it. We can see how this is a subsection, and the next section is number 2. Again, close up. And then we'll go back to the field group section for A4. And then A5, we see that we do have a nest in A5, so next we're going to end up with a close-up of that particular nest. And we'll go back to A6. And again, a close-up of that nest, which is also in A6. And A7, close-up of this nest, number 38, that's in A7, which is right there. So there you can see how the report is organized with sections and subsections and I'm not sure how many layers you could actually go down, how many levels of subsection you could actually go in. If there's a limit or not, probably as a practical limit, you wouldn't want to go much more than two. Things would get really confusing really quick. Like I said, I know they're planning on coming out with a lot of new features for reporting when QGIS 3.2 comes out. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what that would be. I think there's a lot of potential. Like, for instance, maybe the ability to input a chart that just relates to the data on a particular map. Or maybe a report showing the tabular data formatted really nice, like for instance, for each pipeline, it would list all the environmental constraints that impact that pipeline, and things like that. So there's a lot of potential there. I don't know if any of those things will show up. I have this seen them suggested, so my guess is they're probably working on something similar. But again, we're just going to have to wait and see. So that's reporting in QGIS 3. I'd encourage you to play around with it on your own and see what you come up with. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Thanks for listening. If you want to learn more about some of the great new features of QGIS 3.0, or just more about QGIS in general, I have an entire course available on Udemy called QGIS 3.0 for GIS Professionals. As you might have guessed from the name, this is not a beginner course. It assumes that you are already familiar with GIS concepts and are primarily interested in learning how to perform the tasks that you already do in QGIS. I also have four other courses available on web programming and spatial databases if you're interested in those topics. The first is an introduction to the basic concepts of web programming, but focused on geospatial technologies. You'll get an introduction to HTML, CSS, JavaScript, 
PHP and SQL, but more importantly, you'll gain an understanding of how they all work together to create a web-based GIS application. You'll also get introduced to some geospatial-specific libraries, APIs, and extensions like Leaflet, Turf, and PostGIS. The second course is a more in-depth look at the Leaflet JavaScript library for creating web maps and analyzing spatial data in the browser. The third course looks specifically at adapting WebGIS applications for use on mobile devices, including working with device sensors like GPS and dealing with situations where you have no data available. The fourth course covers spatial databases and spatial SQL with an emphasis on using PostGIS as the database and QGIS as the client. You'll learn about manipulating the data, querying your data, developing custom functions and triggers to automate your business logic, and administering the database to keep it running smoothly. And I'm currently working on a course on server-side programming for WebGIS applications that will explain how to interact with a central database to query data stored in PostGIS and save data that was created in your web application. This course will also go through the process of building a login system to manage and control access to your web applications. And I expect this course to be completed by the end of May 2018. So if you have an interest in any of these courses, please go to udemy.com and you can use the coupon code COURSE4 to register for any of these courses for only $20. And if you want more information about any of these courses and other geospatial topics, you can check out my blog at the address above or just Google geospatial brainstorming.